back to another episode of the Brigade of Imbeciles. Today, we'll be exploring episode 5, The Best Revenge is Dressing Well. Dressing well. That's how you, that's how you talk. <laughs> the Best Revenge is Dressing Well. I don't like this episode. Bro, that can be a random fun fact. Actually, you can, we can say that our fun fact was Buttons was basking in the moonlight. <laughs> yeah, 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 it's a fun fact. Uh, it was backed up by one of the writers who said that Buttons never missed a, a bus, a yeah. glow bask, a moon, moon glow. What the fuck are you talking about? And here's a sneak peek from today's episode. Wah, 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 wah. <laughs> fuck. Cut. Like Lucia said, we don't own each other. There's such a huge difference between the way Steed runs his crew and the way Blackbeard slash Izzy runs their crew. And ultimately, you can see that Fang obviously has no respect for Izzy. He's calling him like Izzy the Spewer. And in the meantime, like people do have respect for Steed because he cares about his crew. So in episode 5, we really take a look at how Steed's world of aristocracy brings out a lot of Edward's insecurities. We delve into Ed's past and his childhood growing up, how his mother always said that they are different. They never got to have nice things. Yeah. And it kind of illuminates why, or the motivations behind why Ed is so interested in the world of the aristocrats and why initially at least he took such an interest in Steed's way of life and his love of fabrics. But Steed is completely different from the normal aristocrat that that we can see in this episode because obviously because he's generous and he's kind towards Ed. And you can see the juxtaposition with the captain that they tie up and eventually skin. You can see how Steed treats Ed versus how the racist pirate treats Ed. And you can see how Steed reacts to the rich aristocrats on the party boat and how he's way more concerned with Ed's feelings and how Ed is compared to how they see him as a person, even though he's from their world. Yeah, I think this episode kind of centers a lot around, again, how both Steed and and Edward have this kind of like influence over one another, right? I mean, the episode starts off with Steed being introduced deeper into Ed's world and learning from Ed and and learning from Blackbeard's crew. And learning how to raid a boat. Yeah, and learning how to not replace books that he's looting with books that he's already read. And I think we see like a different side of Steed, one that maybe only Izzy has seen so far. Like Steed just trying to be mean and he's trying to be firm, but he's just still failing and Ed has to take over and kind of show him the reins in that way. Like when Steed threatens Izzy and it, and is rude to Izzy, that's like genuine. Yeah. But when, when Steed is trying to threaten the, the captain, he isn't really that into it. He's like, he kind of gives up after a little bit. And yeah, then he's has not trying Ed, hard yeah, enough. He, adds, he lets Ed take over. Yeah, and kind of like on that, on that flip side, right, with the main idea of this episode being that we see Edward being introduced into high society and how that brings out a lot of his insecurity. I think apart from like how comedic the entire scene is, you know, with these caricatures of, of aristocrats and, and people in, in high society, we actually still see that at the heart of it, Steed is still being very, very emotionally supportive of Edward and saying that, you know, if you're feeling overwhelmed, you know, we can go back to the ship. And he's also being so thoughtful in teaching Edward how to use uh, all these um, cutlery from, from fine dining. And we see Edward as someone who's, I wouldn't say clueless when it comes to these etiquettes, but clearly it's the first time that he's ever been introduced to this. And it's, it is overwhelming in a way. Yeah. And also we can see that Ed is determined to kind of fit in even though Steed is saying like you know don't worry if you don't fit in we can always go back no problem and Ed is so determined and he feels he feels happy when they accept him and when they say oh you're fascinating blah 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 like he he's he feels validated but then Steed knows that it's it's a fickle crowd and he like tries to warn him and through just throughout the episode you can see that he's really concerned for Ed I mean the fella just met him like three days ago but he's already so concerned about Ed's emotional well-being. Yeah, I think with Edward, like, we always have to remember that he wants to have fun, right? So a part of wanting to go to this fancy party is also, in a way, curiosity at how the high society lives, but also, in a way, it's theatrical, right? He is embodied embodying Jeff, the accountant. Yeah, but I would I would say that the main point of him wanting to go to that to that party is him wanting to prove to himself that he can yeah. be one of them. And, well, he's just curious. And I mean, look, look at his face when Frenchie passes them the, the invitation, you know. He's like, he's so vulnerable. He literally looks like a puppy. He's excited, but he's also like, he really wants to prove himself. Especially after being called a donkey and the captain saying, I wasn't expecting one of your kind. It reminds him how terrible people can be. Yeah, and it's definitely a racially motivated comment, right? And we see how this affects Edward and how he wishes after hearing that comment, to skin to skin the guy with a snail fork. Yeah, and we can see Steed's reaction in that as well, because it's like the first time that 
I mean, that we've seen, Ed react so violently, and Steed is ready to pick his chair back up and make him comfortable again and try to be there for him physically and as a friend. And even after that scene, after the flashback to his mom, Steed is there again to ask him if he's doing okay, to explain what passive aggression is. Yeah, I feel like in many ways with the previous episode where we see Edward uh, meeting Steed in a very vulnerable position, here in a reverse, we are seeing Steed meet Edward in a very vulnerable position where they are really opening up to each other. And when that eagerness to fit in with the aristocrats bites Ed in the ass, he gets angry and he rages to Steed and Frenchie uh, at the end of the party. And Steed sees that and sees how, how affected Ed is and he immediately steps up and says, you know, you're in over your head. These are my people and I will deal with them. Like, it's like yeah. swoon-worthy. He's like immediately there to defend Ed. Yeah, and I think Ed has a kind of like mutual respect and admiration for that. Yeah, he never expected it. Like, you can see in his face when, yeah. when everybody's like, puking on each other, beating each other up, and Steed is just there like with a with a shit eating grin on his face, like like enjoying the chaos that is unfolding in front yeah, of him. All and, for Blackbeard. Yeah, and you, you juxtaposition that scene with like the first scene of like the 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 pirate raid. It's like the violence is kind of similar, but it's just like the raid versus these aristocrats attacking each other. And Steed is the reason is the the sole reason for this happening. And he's like just so chuffed. And Ed is just like in awe. And then we cut to them rowing back to the ship. And Ed is just still staring lovingly. Or even, he looks a bit like confused about why Steed would do that for him. But he, he, he looks confused and he's like staring at Steed and he's like, when you cut loose, you really cut loose. His eyes are always on Steed. Yeah, and it's like he's see, surprised. Yeah, he's surprised that like somebody has done this for him. And you can see like people on the party ship like up in flames jumping off the ship it's just like and steed is just like completely fine he's like yeah worth it you know anything to to help my boyfriend yeah exactly <laughs> anything to stand up for my boyfriend yeah so meanwhile on the ship we also have the pyramid scheme happening right so we have frenchy and we have oluande and well they're just there to scam the aristocrats i feel like the pyramid scheme really brings out a deeper look into frenchy's past we see how he is acquainted with high society but not part of it because as he mentioned he spent some time in the service right as, as a servant and i do feel that his time as a servant has really led him to understand a bit about you know steed's upper crust life and and the underbelly of it right he is so aware of the goals that the upper crust people have right which is just to make more money and, and he yeah and leverages and their insecurities that. as yeah, well exactly yeah and he leverages that and lures them in with what they want right I feel like it does shine a light on the class hierarchy, you know. On the other hand, you can also see Oluwande and how he's not really exposed to this part of society. So he's kind of like just going along with Frenchie and Frenchie is the one steering it. And in the end, they make friends with the other servants slash slaves and they successfully scam them all the money from these idiots, from these rich idiots, and they get away scot-free. Yeah, and it was like the birth of the Nigerian prince scam, <laughs> yeah, was it? and the pyramid scheme. Yeah, and the pyramid scheme. Incredible writing. Kind of a small tangent, but in this episode, you can you can really see how Steed is as a captain and how his crew treat him as a captain. I mean, like, they're almost like equals. They're like friends. Like, back on the ship, you can see, like, Fang posing naked on Steed's bed as, as Lucius, like, draws him naked, you know. And it's, like, hilarious. They're just, like, using the captain's quarters, like, no yeah. no issue. During the pyramid scheme, Steed is, like, trying to find Olu, Oluwande and Frenchie, and they're, like, uh, no, no, just close the door. And they're shoving Steed out the door. And he's like desperately saying like, I'm their captain. It's not disrespectful, but they know that Steed is like a nice guy. They don't fear him. You know what yeah. I mean? Compared to that to Izzy and Blackbeard, it's like Izzy's trying so hard to be scary throughout this episode. He keeps pushing Lucius around and like using threats. Aggression. And, and, Pure yeah, aggression. And, like aggression and like just screaming at him and... He thinks that he has the upper hand because Lucius was like drawing Fang naked. Like like Lucius said, we don't own each other. There's such a huge difference between the way Steed runs his crew and the way Blackbeard slash Izzy runs their crew. And ultimately, you can see that Fang obviously has no respect for Izzy. He's calling him like Izzy the spewer. And in the meantime, like people do have respect for Steed because he cares about his crew. It's quite progressive. Yeah, and it also kind of makes you think of like Blackbeard as a captain. Because usually, I mean, throughout the whole show, it's usually Izzy is the one who's like barking out commands, yeah. you know? So Blackbeard has really, or Edward, has really kind of let go of the reins. Yeah, he has. And Izzy is like foaming at the mouth to take over. And that's the whole reason he stayed is because the promise of taking over command. 
I think this episode really brings out a very strong um, queer element to the series, right? That we see um, Lucius and Black Pete having fun and we John just like absolutely giving zero shits, just like napping there in the same environment as them and how they're also open with each other in a way. Yeah, the, it's yeah. so funny. And how like we John just like looks at Izzy is like, be a dear and get me one of those. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's really, really no, no given. Yeah, there's like yeah. no boundaries between them and yeah. it's so open and, and honest with each other right and and Izzy comes in and he breaks this dynamic instantly because he immediately mocks them for and he mocked them for being gay I don't even know because he yeah, kind of I don't know if he's mocking them for being gay he just says like oh you're trying to be cute in a way he's just mocking them I mean I can't determine the motivations behind why he's mocking them. Yeah. But it, it does seem like when he goes like, you know, ooh, daddy. Yeah, yeah. Like he thinks that that's the image of queerness. Yeah. Or he, he just has daddy issues. I don't know. Daddy issues. That's the first time this is mentioned in a podcast. Yeah, I mean, from from that kind of like mocking Lucius to, to pushing him around, it does seem that he's trying to assert a kind of dominance, right? Over Lucius and, and over the crew of the Revenge in general. But like you mentioned, like they get absolutely no respect oh he says what the fuck (laughs) for izzy you can see quite a lot of that toxic masculinity in him right he's not that open to the idea of having absolutely no boundaries of of men sharing their feelings and emotions for one another and you know when he sees lucius drawing fang's dick he immediately goes like what the fuck like he does not know how to process and, and react to that he's just not used to how steed runs his crew yeah exactly and and how they're just so open with each other like what lucius said they don't own each other I think the episode ends on the sweetest scene in the entire series for me. I must admit, I think this was the first time, when I watched it the first time, this was probably the moment where I felt like, hey, you know, what's going on between them? Is there something more? Like, will there be something more? Or am I just being baited again? Yeah, like personally, when I watched it, because I was watching it for the first time. I mean, like I was watching it as the episodes were coming out. And I honestly did not, I just didn't want to let myself, you know, get baited. So I just, I literally just assumed that they were just joshing and it was queer bait. So I didn't, I didn't really take it seriously, but it's just a completely different perspective when you know that they're, they're in love and you know that they are falling in love, actively falling in love. Like this scene just becomes so much, so much more beautiful when you know that there's hope. I mean, when, when Ed really like lets down all his walls and shows Steed the red silk, that was just such a beautiful freaking moment. AKA his heart. And his vulnerabilities. Yeah, and the way like Ed clings onto the red silk. Yeah, as, as Steed is like slowly pulling it from his grasp. And, and the way that Steed is so gentle. He's so yeah, gentle holding genuine. it. Yeah, just like, there you go. And then he like tucks it into his, into his pocket. And Ed is just like <laughs> speechless. <laughs> so sweet. And he says like the sweetest line. You wear fine things well. And in an interview, David Jenkins, the creator, he actually does talk about how Ed reaches out in that moment. Like he wants to step in for a kiss, but it doesn't come to fruition. And he talks about like as a as a straight man, he thought that that scene would be really, really obvious that they're definitely aiming towards a romance. And he only realized after every after it it came out and everybody watched it, how many how many people kind of thought that it was queer bait and didn't take it seriously because of how often people have been queer baited by shows like Supernatural and Sherlock, you know, and he was he said like how how sad that is that people don't want to raise their expectations. We don't want to get our hopes yeah, high we because get our hopes up. we've been cheated once before. Exactly. Instead of, of anything happening, you know, we get a, a little pat on the shoulder. We get a little nice glance back at each other. Yeah, and it, it was... I mean, I wouldn't say it's little. They, they glance back at each other very... It was a very it significant... It was a very sweet little moment. That it was very significant, a very long glance back. And and you can also see the, the differences between Ed and Steed um, in, that, in that moment. Like, you can see, like, Steed is... He's just reacting. Basically, he's just reacting to what's happening, and yeah. Ed is the one who's like leading it, who's most like of the time. vulnerable, who's like, "What's going on?" You know, who's like the the way he looks at the way he looks at Steed. You know that he's whipped, and Steed is just like he's just like <laughs> being super nice and genuine, and he doesn't know how to kind of or he doesn't know that what he's doing is kind of maybe leading Ed on because he's never been in love. Like Steed has yeah. never been in love. This yeah, is Steve's his first it, time. Yeah, yeah, he's finding this he's finding it out as he goes, right? Yeah. So he doesn't even like think it's a possibility. And meanwhile Ed is like constantly on edge and he's always reaching out. And the way that he reacts to Steed's gentleness and respect towards his teddy old thing, he's just 
dumbfounded basically and Steed still he, Steed is just like sometimes old things are the best things and he's so gentle with it it's such a fragile piece of Ed even without knowing the past or the, the history behind the red silk Steed can tell that it's really special and he treats Ed with that respect and he treats Ed with that care yeah with that empathy that we see mostly from his crew and, and from him yeah meanwhile the big question is where was Buttons in <laughs> this basking, basking, nearby. basking in the moon glow with yeah. Carl like, where was he? He was probably, like, watching. It's like, one deck above, just watching this, like, love story play out. And yeah, he's like, if, if the camera panned up slightly, you can see him, like, just in his butt naked, naked, naked yeah. glory. Looking down. Yeah, exactly. Are they gonna kiss or what? Yeah. <laughs> and th- this, this theory was actually confirmed by one of the writers who said, you know, Buns never misses a moon glow. So he was somewhere. Yeah. Probably trying to be very quiet to let them have their little, their little moment. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> And now, some fun facts. In the flashback scene with Ed and his mom, Ed's mom is actually Maori. So it's canon that Edward is Maori. You can see his deadbeat dad in the corner drunk, which is kind of difficult to spot at first because the shot cuts away really, really quickly. And also, according to David Jenkins, Izzy was the one who put ribbons in Blackbeard's beard. But they had to cut the scene for time. So I don't know if it was actually shot, but if it was shot, they really have to release that in the deleted scenes. Some behind-the-scenes fun facts. We have a writer who was one of the aristocrats, the lady who jumps up and down before Edward and Steve comes down the stairs. She's one of the writers. There's also a great photo of Reese in his outfit sitting on a throne. He may have walked over to the King George set to pose for a quick shot. There's also a great photo of Izzy and Lucius taken by on-set photographer Aaron Epstein, where Izzy is very, very close and clinging on to the back of Lucius's head, and Nathan Fode calls it the horniest photo of all time. And last but not least, apparently Steed invented phrenology because that wasn't a thing back in those days. It was only invented in the later part of the 18th century. So my favorite quote for this episode is Just ignore him, Ed. Don't debase yourself for a man who hasn't a single tureen on board. Just ignore him, Ed. Don't debase yourself for a man who hasn't a single tureen on board. And my favorite quote is Hey guys, uh, the boss is looking for you. What? Blackbeard's back? Oh shit. Oh no, no, no. It's a little angry fecker, Izzy. Hey guys, uh, the boss is looking for you. What? Blackbeard's back? Oh shit. Oh no, no, no. It's that little angry fecker, Izzy. I think for me, episode 5 is when things really start getting a little bit more real and you feel that their relationship is moving in a very significant manner forward. It's definitely a turning point. And it's quite fitting that it's, you know, halfway through the the season as well. It really guides the audience towards paying more attention to how they interact with each other, their yeah. dynamic, and mm-hmm. and where it's going moving forward. So I guess that's all we have time for today. Thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next week when we have a news update for all the new information regarding Season 2. Bye! Bye!